Welcome very much, very warmly, to our second plenary panel, second day of our virtual conference. And our panel here is titled Fostering and Sustaining Anti-Capitalist Solidarities. And first I'd like to acknowledge traditional peoples of Australian lands from which sovereignty was never ceded. And for me, my home and work happens on Wiradjuri nation lands by Murrumbidgee River. And I'd like to pay respect to traditional owners and elders past, present and emerging. Okay. So panel today um, on fostering and sustaining anti-capitalist solidarities. David Fryer um, was, um, we're very grateful to David for convening and organizing this panel. So we've got David from the University of Queensland, Australia. He's quite a bit further north than a lot of us, um, although not as north as you can be in Australia. Um, and then we've got Garth Stevens speaking from the University of the Witwatersrand, um, South Africa. And then Thomas Teo at York University in Canada. And then Gina Lango at the University of California at Santa Cruz, USA. And then finally, we've got Inacio Dobles, University of Costa Rica. And then we're very um, honored to have Nohiyate Awa Kuotuku from the University of Auckland, um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, for all of you, I apologize if, because I, my pronunciation of anything is terrible. Um, I will read um, just the quick description before I invite David to begin. Panel members will draw upon diverse forms of critical theory, the wider humanities, arts and social sciences, to explore how contemporary neoliberal capitalism is related to the diverse forms of violence visited globally upon people, families, communities, cultures, societies and environments. Whilst recognising not only the contemporary global dominance and relentless barbarity of capitalism, but also the thorny critical challenges of fostering and sustaining capacities for resistance and anti-capitalist solidarities, the panel unambiguously rejects the dominant nihilistic discourse that there is no alternative to it. So firstly, I'd like to welcome David Foria. And I need to share my screen, don't I, for David. We're going to read. Um, I want that one. Can people see? People are able to see. On you go, David. I can. Right. Thank you very much, Rachel, indeed. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the University of Queensland, where I'm currently based, is situated, the Turrbal Yugara people, and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet virtually today. On behalf of the University of Queensland, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their very valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Just like to say that I wish to thank Rachel and Chris for having the vision to ensure that capitalism and anti-capitalism were put centrally into the agenda of this uh, this conference. I'd like to thank fellow panelists for, and discussants and chair for making the panel actually happen. And I'd like to acknowledge the uh, the contributions of Charles Marley and Rose Stanby. I've worked with both with both of them for around, well, much more than 10 years in Charles' case, but um, we worked so much on topics together that um, I'm sometimes unclear where ideas have their origins. But um, anyway, thank you very much. They're actually um, presenting later on this morning. So let me uh, see if I can, excuse me one moment. I just want to get my timer going. Right. Uh, so my first critique of unemployment and mental health research was published in 1984. Unemployment, which had been rising throughout the 1970s, accelerated after Margaret Thatcher took power in 1979, and it peaked at over 3 million in 1983, when I was writing that paper, actually. At that time, the right had reluctantly come to accept that involuntarily unemployed people had poorer mental health than comparable employed people, but they still insisted that it was the poor health which caused the unemployment rather than the other way around. My preoccupations at that time were with, firstly, 
what it is about unemployment which caused misery, morbidity and mortality. Secondly, how mass unemployment was actively constituted to be so aversive that the unemployed would function as a reserve army of labour, serving the interests of market capitalism by disciplining the in-work employed to restrain wage demands, undermine calls for improved working conditions and control inflation. And thirdly, naively, as I discovered, the use of research legitimated knowledge claims to politically challenge health consequences of neoliberal capitalism. I've published research and scholarship about unemployment most years since 1984, often several times a year. During that time, I moved from thinking about my work as social psychological, influenced by Maria Hoda, to thinking of my work as community psychological, to thinking of my work as critical psychological, to current stage now, but perhaps not the end, thinking of my work as post psychomplexical the psychomplex being the heterogeneous knowledges, forms of authority and practical techniques that constitute psychological expertise, largely invested since the mid 19th, invented since the mid 19th century, which has a key role in constructing governable subjects. There I'm actually quoting from Nicholas Rose from 1999. Obviously, I don't have time to discuss all my critically morphing work in 10 minutes. Instead, I'm going to just start by summarizing that researchers working at a variety of levels of investigation in a variety of geographical contexts during a variety of historical periods over 80 years, supported by a variety of funding models, underpinned by a variety of political ideological assumptions, using a variety of research methods and study designs, have with rare near unanimity, I'd actually say critically suspicious unanimity, agreed that unemployment causes mental ill health. So is such research, which inscribes the psi complex, intrinsically anti-capitalist? Have we got research showing that uh, capitalism is destructive of people? Well, no, at least not within the critical frame of reference that I've adopted in this presentation, which draws on the work of Nicholas Rose, as said, Didier Fassin, Zhao Biel, and ultimately Michel Foucault, though a little way away from Michel Foucault these days. Within this critical frame of reference, it's assumed that questions must be asked about which interest groups would gain, in which ways, at which times, etc., and which would lose, firstly, if specific knowledge claims, for example, the causal relationship between psychological ill health and unemployment, discursively positioned as true by the psi complex, were acted upon as if actually true. To connect with a question posed after panel one yesterday, in this critical frame of reference, knowledge creation is not an illusion, but the result of truthing practices within specific regimes of truth in the interests of specific interest groups. Secondly, which interest, interest groups would gain if specific objects of thought, for example, self-esteem or anxiety, depression, activation and so on, discursively positioned as an inscription of naive realism by the psi complex were acted upon as if it's real. They are real, but only in the sense that they're socially manufactured, legitimated and deployed to material effect within specific ontic or ontological regimes. Thirdly, which interest groups would gain if specific practices, for example, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, surrogate latent function provision, and so on, discursively positioned as evidence-based by the psi complex were acted upon as if effective. Fourthly, which interest groups would gain if specific knowledges and practices discursively positioned as good, as progressive, as ethical, and so on, by the psi complex, were acted upon as if moral? To connect with another issue which emerged in panel one yesterday about whether it would be desirable for a focus on relational ethics to replace an alleged focus on epistemology, within this critical frame of reference, what is ethical is produced, I would say constituted, circulated and so on, within a particular moral economy, which serves the interests of particular groups. Specific moral economies have genealogy, genealogies 
and are contingent rather than necessary. Moral absolution, absolutism is rejected within this frame of reference. <clears throat> Excuse me. The dominant versions of what is true, real, evidence-based, moral, and so on, tend to be the versions that serve the interests of the most powerful interest groups, of course, which have the most power to discredit, marginalize, and subjugate versions which are not in their interests, and to position versions which are in their interests as inevitable, necessary, and without alternatives. Note that this critique, or at least I'll, I'll try to assure you that if we had more time, I could show you that this critique applies to any set of claims, which conclusions, on the basis of empirical truthing, knowledgeing, reeling, efficaciousing, or writing, to put those terms into verbs, including social psychology, societal psychology, community psychology, and critical psychology, liberation psychology, um, and of course, to be provocative, maybe indigenous psychologies too. As a critical scholar, rather than as an activist, I neither endorse nor repudiate what is discursively positioned within the psych complex as true, real, effective, or moral. Rather, I try to reposition what's positioned by others as necessary, inevitable, natural, moral, and without alternatives as contingent, socially constituted, and so socially reconstitutable. Agreeing with Magnus Pauls and Hansen that critique seeks to problematize modes of governing with the emancipatory aim of encouraging critical practices understood in the broadest possible way as pointing to the possibility of otherness. Although superficially psych complex unemployment knowledge work appears to provide evidence and ways of thinking and conducting oneself consistent with left criticisms of capitalism, psych complex unemployment knowledge work, truthing and so on, serves the interests of groups which benefit from the dominance of the medical model, the dominance of naive realism. Because unemployment and mental health are constituted, it doesn't mean they're imaginary in a conventional sense, and it does not mean that they have no material effects. They are real in the sense that they're socially manufactured, legitimated and deployed to material effect through interconnected politico-economic policies, active labor market technologies, welfare bureaucracies, discursive systems, and so on, as well, of course, as the knowledge work of psi complexifiers of unemployment and mental health, mental ill health. The positioning of the psi complex as a progressive science tackling social causes of social injustice, misery, morbidity, rather than as an element in an apparatus of interconnected elements whose primary function is to control inflation, reduce wage costs, discipline those in work, while simultaneously constituting the neoliberal unemployed subject in such ways as to reproduce the immiserated, compliant human means of production required by capitalist employers, shareholders, and government. Fourthly, the side complex serves the interests of groups benefiting from the minimization of material want, relative poverty, stigma, bureaucratic violence, and so on, actively constituted to be central to the lived experience of the neoliberal unemployed subject. And the positioning of capitalist employment as cellogenic, psychological health promoting, not only necessary, but ideal for well-being, according to the side complex, at least as um, we hear it through Marie Yehoda's legacy. The side complex serves the interests of groups which benefit from the positioning of the psychological problems of neoliberal capitalist unemployment as actually the psychological problems of deprivation of neoliberal capitalist employment, natural, inevitable psychological consequences of depriving a person of employment-related psychologically benevolent structures, rather than of interconnected manifestations of social violence <clears throat> necessary to constitute the neoliberal unemployed subject who functions optimally in the interests of capital. Seventh, benefit from the positioning of capitalist re-employment, even if precarious, insecure, temporary, part-time, unprotected, degrading, and toxic, as a solution to the misery of capitalist unemployment. Eighth, benefit from the dominance of victim blaming, individualistic, intrapsychic, psychologistic, materialist, materially decontextualized, 
depoliticized therapeutic and big pharmaceutical interventions to treat the preventable psychological consequences of capitalist unemployment. And ninth, the psych complex serves the interests of groups who benefit from the dominance of enlightenment, modernist knowledges and practices central to governmentality, deployed by Western Northern metropolitan colonizing knowledge as that and knowledge as how. The presentation, uh, 11 minutes, sorry. The presentation in a nutshell, is psych complex knowledge work compatible with anti-capitalism? I've argued not. It's necessary to abandon the psych complex to engage in critical anti-psych complex knowledge work in order to engage in critically coherent anti-capitalist knowledge work. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, David. Very, um this really powerful arguments for um, the ways that employment and unemployment maintain our uh, keep us uh, compliant, I think, for me. Um, thank you very much. Just a reminder to people who are watching um, at any time that the panelists are speaking, if you want to pose any questions, please feel free to do so. We'll tackle them at the end and you can do that in the Q&A. Um, window and uh, people can vote them up and down and so on. Um, so we move now to, um, sorry, I'm forgetting my list. Garth Stevens from the University of Witteswiland, South Africa. Um, so I'll hand over to Garth. Thanks, Garth. Thanks. Uh... <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, You're a little bit quiet again, Garth. Sorry. Am I? Am I? Am I? Oh, that's fine. Bit... Is that better? Yeah. That's great. Um, so, uh, Rachel, uh, firstly, thank you to you and to colleagues for the invitation to participate in this panel. Uh, and really what I'd like to speak about today is, is capital and its contiguous relationship to, to violence. And obviously also I'd like to reflect on the centrality of violence in the making of Western modernity and the constitution of subjects through violence in the era of late capital. Uh, this violence I'm suggesting is a key element of systems of oppression, both structurally and through processes of subjectification within contemporary capitalism that I think is often invisibilized as a system of oppression itself, as violence is often only thought about instrumentally in the service of, or as an aberrant epiphenomenal reaction to, or consequence of these systems of oppression. So my argument really runs counter to the work of writers like Steven Pinker, who of course suggests that we are in fact in a period of long decline in rates of violence, or those who suggest that the, the modern Weberian state has monopolized violence and therefore curtailed its expansiveness, or Hannah Arendt's suggestion that violence and power are inimical to each other, or for that matter, Foucault's suggestion that violence simply precedes more complex strategic relations of power, or on the other hand, George Soral claims that violence is a necessity in the creation of more equitable societies. But indeed also that the work that many of us do in the area of violence prevention and reduction implicitly apprehends violence as a moral deviation or outlier to modernity. And the problem with all of these is that in these instances, there is the attempt to quell violence as something that seemingly sits outside of the historical and ontological frame of capitalism and Western modernity. And I believe that this is an analytic error. So Western modernity itself brought with it the paradigm of discovery and newness that also included the gradual propagation of capitalism, racism, and the modern system of gender inequality. And of course, I'm quoting uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres there. The rise of Western modernity converges with European expansionism, slavery, and colonialism. And violence was not only central to its birthing, but also to its sustenance and its reproduction. This entire modernist project and its associated colonial matrix of power is constituted through violence and as such constitutes violent subjects in one way or another. Now, this is not to say that violence did not exist prior to modernity, but it is in the sheer scale of the modernist project that for the first time we start to see the emergence of global configurations of subjectivity that are in fact based on violence. In this period and subsequent periods, we witnessed the suspension of ethics, or at least the replacement of an ethics of sacrifice 
with an ethics of massacre, of terror, of war and alterity in which violence is completely naturalized. It is the suspension of ethics uh, alongside the reconfiguration and recalibration of model orders that are precondition for dehumanization, objectification, commodification, a deferral of empathy and the terror that we see in so many forms of violence. Writers like Vina Dust and Franz Fanon were also clearly arguing that the systems of oppression that had resulted in colonialism were rooted in Western modernity's violence and was a project of damnation bringing into reality a global system of inequality, not one simply with the periphery and the center at odds, but a completely new world order and that counter violence was a seductive option because subjectivities were themselves rooted in violence. So what does that mean for democracy today? Well, rather than viewing the state as envisaged by Weber, contemporary democratic states may collude with embedded elites, such as drug cartels, resident leaders, to sustain violent and authoritarian local regimes linked to lucrative financial flows, derived from drug trading, mineral extraction, for example, and so on. The state party nexus itself becomes a site of violence in which different factions compete with each other to access resources and reconstitute patronage relations. The state may also recapitulate colonial repertoires of violence in repressing popular expressions of grievance against criminals, foreigners, dissenting groups, and so on. In all of these instances, we need to rethink and disaggregate the state and democracy and its contradictory forms and practices, making use of rethinking concepts such as violent pluralism, brown or gray zones of politics where violence produces low intensity citizenship, violent democracies or disjunctive democracies, all of which reveal much larger and wider distributional regimes of violence outside of the state as well, uh, and in an attempt to create modes of social order. So what does this mean for the subject? Well, the citizen arises coterminously as a concept in the moment of the modern state, and yet the kinds of state practices mentioned uh, above give rise to differentiated regimes of subjecthood and citizenship in which democratic rights are unevenly distributed. Some citizens may be constituted as violent, while others are constituted as targets, for example. Violence itself is also commodified in our relational lives. It is central to and is central to subject constitution. Within the unevenness of capitalism, violence and who has the monopoly on it is itself contested. And so it's no wonder that violence can therefore be seen to be accomplishing various forms of work, destructive and productive, disordering and ordering, or asocial or seemingly pro-social. So if we are to accept the thesis of um, modernity being invocated with violence uh, and citizenship and alterity at its core, then what, what are the incursions into subjectivity uh, in relation to violence? So Western modernity, the development of early modes of capitalism and European expansionism introduced early philosophies of humanism that have had many iterations since, but have had a number of aspects in common. They all tended to establish hierarchies of those who were considered human, less than human or non-human. These elements give rise to understandings of who is killable or not, when violence is thinkable and doable or not, who may be disposed of or not, who sits inside the protection of the law or not, and when life becomes grievable or not. This has a direct impact on our sense of morality as social subjects, on our understandings of states of exception, moral inclusion, moral exclusion, and so on. Within a politicized understanding of morality, we may very well encounter discourses that elevate the sanctity of life, sitting uncomfortably alongside discourses that do not distinguish between the importance of subject and object or things under capitalism, a form of necropolitics, if you will, where some are considered objects or things and relegated to the status of the living dead. A failure to recognize these differing economies of morality means that we often depart from the assumption that human life is worthy of preservation, when in fact large sectors of the population may consider the life of the subject to be no more valuable than objects in our social world, thereby enabling enactments of violence that at times may be viewed as perverse or gratuitous. Violence only becomes possible inside such economies of morality. This is how we arrive at husbands and fathers being born as monsters in the context of honor killings, or for camp commandants during the Holocaust to participate in the extermination of children during the day and to read bedtime stories to their own children at night, or for our neighbors to be our killers in moments of genocide. With regard to interpersonal violence, we often think of it as being premised purely on infrahumanization and hyperobjectification. 
but we are not only very much capable of this, but simultaneously also able to hyper subjectify others, to know the impact that the threat or the act of violence will have on them, to see their humanness and to exploit it through violence that is sadistic in character. We therefore have violence in which there is infrahumanization and hyper objectification, but also violence in which there is hyper subjectification, sadistic pleasure, and the suspension of empathy precisely because we know the mind of the other in relation to the preservation of human subjects' lives within modernity. Here, the very affective and emotional lives of subjects are themselves implicated in the reproduction of violence. A corollary of the hierarchization of, of the human, less than human and non-human, is the elevation of the human to the level of the sacrosanct, the biopolitical imperative to maintain life in late capital. But under capitalism, subjects are both to be maintained and controlled. Therefore, the need for the embodied subject to be both protected and threatened. Violence is thus easily encoded into our relationships with our own and others' bodies. Here, the body can be seen variously as a canvas, an instrument of power, a communicative tool, a mode of reinstating citizenship, and of course, as a means of reconstituting obliterated psychic space. Embodied violences such as suicide bombings, drone strikes, detention and torture, all highlight the tensions between sovereignty and biopolitics, sites where there's the constant threat of death and the imperative to keep alive. And so violence itself is coded into the body of the subject. I suppose the, the, the nub of what I'm really trying to convey is that not only is violence central to modernity, but violence is very much implicated in contemporary neoliberal democracies. And I've tried to illustrate that in the constitution of the subject, at the level of the way that we think about our morality, at the level that we think about affectivity and emotionality, and certainly at the level at which we think about embodiment, that violence is, is uh, constitutive of those elements themselves. So let me end with three provocations for our discussion hereafter. Does an interrogation of violence not offer us important opportunities to conduct deep analyses of its contiguous relationship to capital as the hegemonic iteration of contemporary Western modernity and of the workings of capitalism itself? Second, if indeed violence is so pervasive within Western modernity and capitalism, both structurally and in the constitution of the human subject, are there ways beyond violence and what would they look like? And thirdly, is there a place for a politics and praxis of critical humanism and solidarity that redefines different genres of what it means to be human as a potential entry point into offsetting the seeming naturalization of violence and thus the inevitability and unevenness on contemporary capitalism. So Rachel, I think I'm going to leave it there. I think I've uh, just gone over my 10 minutes and thank you very much. Not a problem. <clears throat> thank you very much, Garth. It's difficult being a chair when I'm very um, um, listening too much to what people are saying. <laughs> it's very fascinating. I see real connections between David's um, description of unemployment and unemployment, possibly as a, pro you know, a, a related sort of form of violence. Thank you. Um, we have Thomas Teo from York University, Canada up next. Thomas, you're sharing your screen, I think. Uh. Thank you, that's great, we can see that. Does that work? Yes, it does. Yeah, thanks. So I'm interested for, let me just set my stopwatch here. I'm interested for academic, political and personal reasons. Personal would be I grew up in Austria in fascist subjectivity and I'm not satisfied in way in the way sub, uh, fascist subjectivity has been conceptualized in the past. There's certain problems I have to deal with when thinking about fascist subjectivity. I mean, one of the questions is, can you use a concept that has historical meanings that are embedded in very specific location, let's say Nazi Germany, uh, 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 and also having important variations? My answer would be yes, we can develop a concept of fascist subjectivity that does justice to the past, but also justice to the present. 
some people argue, well, fascism is basically a political and social project. Why would you talk about fascist subjectivity? My answer is, of course, I'm interested as a psychologist in fascist subjectivity. Uh, and fascist subjectivity, of course, has been a long, of long interest in critical theory and critical psychology. Uh, just to shortly, to make a short remark, I'm much more convinced in the social and political and economic theories uh, proposed by critical theory than in their psychology and vice versa, critical psychology. I'm talking here specifically about German critical psychology and particularly convinced by the psychology and less so by actually social and political theory. Another important question, of course, relating to this session is how is fascism actually related to capitalism? And that's an ongoing interest, I think, in most critical uh, approaches. And also, what is at the core of fascist subjectivity? So what I'm trying to do is I try to figure out what is actually at the core of fascism. What is, what is essential, let's say, to fascist subjectivity and not what is accidental to fascist subjectivity. So psychosocial dimensions, are, of course, mentioned in the literature. So if you go back to Wilhelm Reich, you can see uh, the mass psychology of fascism, sexual repression, of course, Adorno's work on authoritarian personality, sexual envy, sadism, and so forth. My critique is that this is too unspecific to identify fascist subjectivity. So just to use the example of authoritarianism, uh, you can find, and I, I think you can do that empirically, but it also makes sense for me conceptually, you can find uh, left-wing authoritarianism and you can find right-wing authoritarianism. So for me, this isn't unspecific. I'm not opposing that, but it's too unspecific to identify fascist subjectivity. So what I'm interested in is in identifying the content of fascist subjectivity and not just an internal dynamic. And this has to do basically with the theory of subjectivity uh, that I'm proposing that connects, of course, what I call socio-subjectivity with intersubjectivity and intersubjectivity. Here's my thesis. The core of fascist subjectivity is capitalist political economic thinking and or doing combined with racism and or subhumanism. I'm trying to explain what I mean by those things. So fascist subjectivity is, is based on a socio-relational ontology the fascist philosophy of alterity is basically the idea there is not enough to go around for all human beings. There is not enough wealth for all human beings. And the, uh, if I say there's not enough wealth for all human beings, I have a pretty broad definition of wealth without going into uh, uh, you know, specific uh, uh, discussions, theoretical discussions. So I'm just saying having, producing, contributing, distributing uh, something more than is needed for survival. And the fascist subjectivity of alternative, basically, wealth should not include the other. And the other can be the close other or can be the distant other. The close other can be the person within our community or within our nation, within our country. The distant other can be the person outside of our community. And you can use rationalizing and subhumanizing discourse and practices. So you can use race theories for the close other. But you can also use subhumanizing theories, meaning a person, let's say the German with disabilities, could not be racialized, but could always be subhumanized. And if you go back, so to say, to Hitler's my, uh, en my main enemies in Mein Kampf, it was clearly Jews and Marxists. Uh, so my point again, so there's a repetition that racism and subhumanism are invoked in, the con in concert with the question of the production, distribution, accumulation of wealth. And you can use an ideological apparatus, but so also I think that's important. And so I, I, I challenge the idea, it's just irrational, the historically constituted experiences of scarcity in capitalism. Uh, so it's not, it's not irrational. Uh, it might not be logical from my perspective, but there's a certain logic, I think, to those, uh, uh, to those ideas. And within fascist subjectivity is not the economic organization that is to blame, but the Jew or Jewish Marxist in Nazi Germany, the foreigner, the migrant, the lazy, unproductive, poor socialist, or the anti-entrepreneurial self. You could connect this to the question of diability, who is diable in a society. Uh, and I think you could connect this, I think, to the COVID-19 pandemic 
you know, who is liable for economic reasons? Well, the elderly, uh, the people with medical uh, preconditions and precarious workers who work with those people. <clears throat> racism, so let me just skip this because this seems pretty uh, clear, I guess, to most people that race theories were developed in order to, uh, to, to provide a intellectual and effective rationale for domination, slavery, colonialism, exploitation, the killing of the other. And what is important for me here is to em emphasize that we also have, of course, a long history of scientific racism. So I oppose also this idea that fascist subjectivity afflicts only specific groups. Well, you have uh, a fascist subjectivity among the elites uh, of society as well, and they might draw, let's say, on scientific uh, racism. And in some countries, people might use culture and religion instead of race. You have the raci racialization of culture, the racialization of religion. Subhumanism, uh, let me discuss it a little bit more in detail, maybe if I have time, uh, because this is probably not a, a self-evident concept, but uh, subhumanism was basically developed by uh, Stoddard uh, with the concept of the underman, a person, quote, who measures under the standards of capacity and adaptability imposed by the social order in which he lives. So what Stoddard needed was not only race theories, but he also want race theories could be covered by degenerates, non-European races, mongrelized populations. But he also needed a concept that could take account of the lower classes, the proletariat, the Bolsheviks, and they could be characterized, let's say they go on strike through according disorderly substandard and deviant behaviors. Subhumanism is a much more visual ontology. It works with uh, 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 pictures and visualizations and imaginations is much more malleable of racism. I think that everybody under the right circumstances could become a subhuman and has a clear and action imperative. If you're a parasite, if you're a cockroach, if you're a rat, of course we have to do something about you. And here's the second uh, document is of course the educational manual of the SS uh, educational office, uh, a 50 page pamphlet, uh, the subhuman, and here on the right side, you can also see on the title page of a magazine in Nazi Germany about a person with disability that basically this person costs too much. This is your money. Uh, and okay, let's take care of this person. Uh, so what, how can we resist fascist subjectivity? Uh, I think one of my point is realizing it's not completely a rational ideology within capitalism. It is logical within capitalism. It's rational, it's effective, it can draw on scientific racism, it can draw on uh, affects, on images and imaginations. Of course, there's the case for education, uh, the, uh, the case for the critical sciences and maybe uh, art uh, encounter images in order to counter, so to say, the images proposed by, uh, uh, by fascism. The question is, can nonviolence overcome fascism? Think about direct action by Antifa. Uh, of course, the boat, the, the boat captains in migration, this is a form of direct action. Or people who go to demonstrate to protect migrants, let's say again in Germany, uh, who are threatened by neo-Nazis. That is direct action. And that might involve even uh, uh, violence. Political action, of course, is important. And I, I think this uh, relates to what previous speakers have said before. Uh, psychology is not enough, empathy is not enough. As I think Gaff pointed out, yes, the Nazi officer could have empathy, but not empathy for the racialized or subhumanized groups, could have empathy towards his community. So I think that psychology and empathy are not enough to deal, so to say, with fascist subjectivity. And if we take this idea seriously, that fascism is related to capitalism, of course, we need an anti-capitalist uh, strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I've swept away listening. Um, thanks, Thomas. Um, that's fantastic. Um, we'll move to Gina Langer at the University of California at Santa Cruz, USA. Thanks, Regina. I'm seeing if I can share everything at once. Let's see here. Okay. Great. paper. Great, I'm gonna go back and forth between my paper and a few pictures. So hopefully I've set this up correctly. Yeah, and it I'll let you know okay. if it drops out, but it should be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, the land I'm on is the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation. 
Today, these lands are represented by the Ama Mutsin tribal band, who are the descendants of the Awaswas and Mutsin nations, whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast of California. Today, the Ama Mutsin are working hard to fulfill their obligation to the creator, to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts and through the Ama Mutsin Land Trust. I do my best to work in solidarity by questioning how Mission Santa Cruz is represented to the public and pushing for a more accurate representation, working against violence in my own community and learning about and teaching decolonial philosophies. So today I'll be talking about protecting property over people as a pathology of capitalism and what this has looked like in Santa Cruz in terms of um, the COVID-19 pandemic and policies toward people who are unhoused and I want to acknowledge um, my kind of co-conspirator and thought partner in these ideas, Abby Samuels, who is with your Allied Rapid Response in Santa Cruz. And I'm also um, in more of my activist work with YAR or your Allied Rapid Response as well. So at this stage, at this late stage of capitalism, the magnitude of inequality continues to grow in the US and especially in California. Santa Cruz, California, commuting distance to Silicon Valley is where Abby and I live. It is a worthwhile example because of the high housing costs, large rental population, and minimal tenants' rights. With a median home price of 957,000 US dollars, 60% of those who live in Santa Cruz are renters, and a wage earner must make over 48 US dollars an hour or almost 100,000 a year per household to escape rent burden. Moreover, Santa Cruz is a prickly space which means the city has enacted laws that criminalize being unhoused through controlling public space. In this paper, we discuss two ways that property has been prioritized over people during the pandemic. The placing of fencing around public and semi-public property and closing streets that enable those who are unhoused to access resources if they have a car. We then discuss two forms of refusal, people leaving food in little free libraries for those who are unhoused and activists moving fences to the police department during Black Lives Matter uprisings. We use a violence framework to understand how city policies harm people who are unhoused during the pandemic. We connect this treatment to the interweaving of cultural and direct violence. Cultural violence is an aspect of culture that can be used to justify another form of violence, such as direct violence. Facets of cultural violence include ideology and the control of public space, like parks and streets, as well as semi-public space, like places that sell goods within a capitalist structure. Direct violence, on the other hand, is an event such as the forced removal of a social group. In the US, one form of cultural violence is an ideology that allows us to put profit before basic human rights and dignity. As a result, 1.9% of those who live in our county are unhoused. And this is the percent before the pandemic and the CZU lightning fire in the Santa Cruz mountains, which destroyed 925 homes. This ideology goes hand in hand with another form of cultural violence, the control of public space. Example one of how public space is controlled. In Santa Cruz, anti-homeless architecture takes the form of putting enclosures around dumpsters, fencing around the community center and post office, locking public parks at night and having few public restrooms hand washing stations, or public drinking fountains available even during the pandemic. The fencing has cost the city of Santa Cruz more than $80,000. It is surely a pathology of capitalism to spend money erecting fences rather than organizing people to build tiny houses or providing more subsidized housing. The fencing shown here, let's see if I can do this now, in this first picture, was put around the post office, which is a place where unhoused people would sit since there are few benches in downtown Santa Cruz. Erecting the fencing had no other purpose than to keep unhoused people from sitting on the steps or to control this public space. As the pandemic unfolded, more fencing was erected. Here, hopefully you can all see that okay. Um, again, to prevent unhoused people from claiming space especially places around businesses as a form of control of the space. So before the pandemic, people who were unhoused were setting up tents along this area. And so this fencing was put up to prevent that from happening. Example two is part of the Slow Streets initiative in our town. Slow Streets is 
a movement designed to make streets more pedestrian and bike friendly. During the pandemic, this movement has been leveraged to close downtown streets so that dining and shopping can happen outdoors, which supports capitalism with a little less risk to public health during the pandemic than eating and shopping indoors, but there's still a risk. In Santa Cruz, residents vote on which streets should be temporarily converted into slow streets. These streets then get signs that discourage driving on them. A main thoroughfare to a park where unhoused people congregate during the day a park with a restroom and access to water until the park is locked at dusk was chosen to be a slow street. This park is near my house and I walk my dogs through the park twice a day and am therefore familiar with the area. On the face of it, the choice to, of closing the street might appear to be positive, but, but the majority of traffic on this street, in addition to people driving to and from their homes, was from people living in their cars who might drive here to refill five gallon water jugs and use the restroom. Perhaps it should not be surprising that a program intended to make the streets more accessible was used to decrease access to needed resources to those who are unhoused. We label the control of public and semi-public space in Santa Cruz as a form of unspectacular direct violence carried out by city staff, police, and unhoused people who vote to close the street. These agents of social control enact violence armed with fences and signs. Although this unspectacular direct violence assaults the sensibilities rather than leaving visible bruises on the body via fists, batons, or clubs, it is still violence that seeps into and under the skin. At the end of the day, Santa Cruz has still displaced marginalized people in our community during a pandemic. Fencing and signs mean that privileged groups regulate the space and place tenants of capitalism via profits sameness and exclusion above values of basic human rights and dignity. Yet whenever there is violence, there is refusal. And I will discuss two refusals, the use of the Little Free Libraries and moving fencing to the city police department. In our community, there are many Little Free Libraries across neighborhoods. On my dog walking route, I passed two. On more than one occasion, once the stay at home order was given for the pandemic, I witnessed more than books showing up in the Little Free Library. Little free libraries are small enclosures people build on their property near the sidewalk and the idea is that anyone can take and leave a book. At the beginning of the pandemic, people began to leave homemade bread, sealed snacks, and more in the Little Free Libraries or near the Little Free Libraries as is shown in the picture here. On more than one occasion, I saw people who appeared to be unhoused take a snack and leave a book. The second example is the removal of fencing from the downtown area. At, at one Black Lives Matter uprising I attended shortly after the public lynching of George Floyd and when questions were being raised in Santa Cruz regarding the death of 21-year-old Tamario Smith, a Black man who the sheriff said died in their custody due to water intoxication or drinking water too quickly, we ended up near the end of town where the fences had been erected. Shortly thereafter, protesters began to dismantle the fence and carried it several blocks to the police station where they left it disassembled in the parking lot. Both examples of refusal show what community cohesion, solidarity and mobilization can look like, even in the face of cultural violence that is designed to dehumanize and devalue the lives of some of the most vulnerable among us. And even at this stage of late capitalism, where there are few structures that facilitate and prioritize care. Indeed, refusing to look away and action can help us remember our connections to one another, which is an important move away from violence and toward liberation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Fantastic. Fascinating examples. Um, we now have um, Ignacio Dobles from the University of Costa Rica. Ignacio is going to speak next. Hi, Ignacio. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I am very honored to be participating in this discussion. You are, you are hearing me, right? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. So many problems. 
I am a psychologist working in Costa Rica with a strong Latin American or Abhi Ayala perspective. Costa Rica is, of course, a small country full of contradictions and problems, though it has managed to promote itself well internationally as the happiest country in the world. It has also been considered the ninth country in the world in inequality, according to World Bank studies. And it is, of course, decidedly capitalist, dependent, and full of coloniality. Our national coin is the Colón, which is Columbus. All has been said, but I will add something else. With a history that in the latter part of the last century parts way with the modes of capitalist domination in other Central American countries, it has been, as Ignacio Martin Baró once said, the place where ideological domination has played a strong role. His exact comment was, while in El Salvador, cocos, coconuts, heads, are broken, in Costa Rica, they are washed. I am part of those Costa Rican psychologists, heavily influenced by Ignacio Martin Baró, who I had the privilege of working with. And we have attempted to pursue his vision of a liberation psychology, which entails, of course, an ethical political stance. A sensibility, I would say, shared also by psychologists in Latin America that have sought to articulate a committed, anti-colonial, decidedly anti-capitalist perspective. And I want to talk a little bit about this. The best moments of this effort in our case is when we have managed to sustain alliances with campesinos and campesinas, migrants, and other vulnerable groups in the direction of articulating critical communities as liberation philosopher Enrique Duso has proposed. That is, critical communities united in the quest for social transformation and equality. I was just thinking that I once heard Christopher Son who's participating, uh, relating uh, experience very much in that line. Martin Baró in his writings in psychology spoke of the construction of popular power. And that was daring, really the construction of popular power. In a wonderful book published in 2019 by Brazilian psychologist, Mariana Alves Gonzalez, the issue is stated in the following matter. It is not a question of developing a psychology for the favela, the slums, but rather the challenge is to fabulize psychology. We have attempted also to participate in international efforts to pursue liberation psychology, including the numerous congresses that were articulated since 1998. We were, as some of you know, busily organizing an international event on psychology and pathologies of capitalism in 2020. We were, of course, forced to cancel our plans, but have been able, and I'm very proud to say it in this forum, to produce seven editions of our psychology and pathologies of capitalism journal. The seventh, which will be distributed next Monday, will commemorate the work of Ignacio Martin Baró. We have been able to share reflections and critical contributions, most of them related with the pandemic, from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, and France. The journal is presented in three languages, Spanish, Portuguese, and English, and it has and it's had a great response from Brazil and other Latin American countries, but honestly, we're somewhat baffled by the lack of response from Anglo psychologists. I have also participated with a small group of Costa Rican psychologists and sociologists in a renewed effort to articulate an anti-colonial, anti-capitalist network of what we have called a Nuestra America psychology that will hold the third event on November 21st with participation from Chile, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Spain, Mexico, and Costa Rica. A liberation psychology, as we understand it, and as Martin Baró demonstrated in his work, is very much concerned with transformative practices and seeks, as Franz Borda wrote, to bridge theory and action in dialectical mode.
This is, of course, an old topic, but we need to be reminded. In the Latin American context and in others, it needs to concern itself with power structures, discriminations, repression, classism, imperialism, coloniality, and its articulation of different dominations, as Elio Tijano wrote. As I have said, we were thwarted in 2020. The pandemic, which I want to refer to, altered our everyday life, and we had to question ourselves. How do we conceive what is going on in this emergency? What could be psychology's role? The questions became very acute when efforts in a community-oriented psychology basically came to a halt. And though psychology as a professor managed to carry out an important and influential program fueled by volunteers and the professional organization, it basically concerned itself with clinical work. Other areas of psychology remain as spectators. The pandemic, of course, created as Martin Baró stated about the Central American crisis in the 80s, a limit situation. And two issues were posed from the onset. The first one was whether there would be equality in the way that the pandemic would be treated, that is care for all. And secondly, if different measures taken during the pandemic would create greater or lesser inequality. Costa Rica at first earned some international recognition as it faced the pandemic with a public health institutionality that though this diminished, had managed to survive the neoliberal onslaught. And those health workers and in other places considered subversive when they strike for better working conditions became for a short while a sort of national heroes. This, however, changed drastically as cases jumped. These are our numbers. I know there's more than the ones we have. Jump from a dozen a day to more than 1,500. We carried out research on the coverture of the press on the pandemic in the period from June 15 to July 15, when infections rose sharply. Not only were then contradictions flourishing in a nutshell that would soon blow all over the place. But as the pandemic developed with the first wave of prioritization of health protection measures, the hegemonic discourse soon, soon began to concentrate on naming the culprits of the pandemic. Beginning as in other places with international travelers, actually the first case in Costa Rica was a, a couple from the US. You know followed by the old Costa Rican motto of blaming poor migrants, especially in Nicaragua, and then shifting, interestingly, very interestingly, to capitalist agribusiness and construction projects. For the first time in the Costa Rican press, the labor exploitation abuses that existed and have been denounced by trade unions and activists, and even in our own work, for example, in the pineapple, the capitalist uh, farms, was shown in the press first time. You know, the system couldn't conceal it anymore. It couldn't, that's a limit situation. It then went on to blame impoverished communities. But the re interesting thing is that in the next step, the culprits disappear because the priority becomes the trivialization and normalization of the pandemic situation so that the pressures of big business could prevail. Meanwhile, not only unemployment rises sharply to 23% of the world population, but pensions were reduced drastically. Next year's annuities eliminated and unified restrictive labor systems announced, which they're cur currently approving. The neoliberal agenda that has dominated public life since 1982 intensified sharply. And meanwhile, dozens of transnationals and Costa Rican large businesses enterprises keep declaring that they have no earnings 
Even some claiming it during 10 years, no earnings, so they don't pay any taxes. We also focus in this context, as I learned from Martin Maro, on the importance of doing more research to better understand and highlight the contradictions surfacing in the face of the pandemic, and to try to introduce in the professional and public debate issues that have been sidelined. We thus proposed a voluntary research project to colleagues and I that was backed, at least symbolically, by the professional association to explore the quotidian life experience of the pandemic in a diverse group of Costa Ricans. We managed, I uh, can really, I think, explain how we did it, but we managed to interview intensively 16 Costa Ricans, eight women and eight men from different locations. And we produce a great deal of material, basing our efforts on Spinoza, uh, writings on ethics and Sartre, and also inspired by Robert J. Lifton's psychohistorical perspective that I've worked on. I, of course, don't have the possibility here of dealing with the full extent of this, but would like to share some of our findings. So everyday life in the pandemic situation is diverse, very diverse and the people interviewed actively sought personal and family strategies to face the challenges existing. We have ample evidence of widespread labor and economic difficulties, which as you would expect, or with people laid off or cut off from their source of income, having to reduce costs, living standards, some received government help, but it was very small and it only lasted two or three months. There is then widespread anxiety and fear derived not only from the danger of the virus, and I would have to say that even the critics, all the people we interviewed carried out the health protection measures set up by the government. In that sense, it's not the US, but also, economic difficulties created a lot of fear and tension. We had, I interviewed a woman from the Atlantic, the Atlantic city of Limon, who said, I wasn't worried with the pandemic when it started because it hadn't reached our city. But when it reached our city, all I did was cry, cry, and cry. And then I had the problem because she was laid off in a casino. I had the problem. If I go out into the city that has the virus going around, I uh, faced the danger of getting contagious, uh, sick, infected. But if I don't, then I have the problem that I will never be able to uh, get all the things that I need. We also, I'm coming near the end now, we also identified ideological work worldviews and their influence in everyday life. For instance, what occurs with conspirativist, that's what we call it, perspective, and also with very focused and clear neoliberal visions that we only found in two men. This is, and I think this is interesting because if we examine briefly the recent political processes in Latin America, it could be argued the social movements and progressive politics are confronted by two ad adversaries that can be deadly. In the one sense, the fundamentalist evangelicals that in some countries like Brazil, Costa Rica also, have immense political power. But additionally, they have to deal not only with neoliberal economists and politicians, but also with the prevailing neoliberal worldview that tends to colonize different spheres as Thomas has very clearly pointed out in his writings. So if you face the fundamentalists, even if you defeat that perspective, then you have to face the neoliberal uh, hegemony existing in the society. In our case, we came to the conclusion that we managed to document the plight of people affected by vulnerability and a deep sense of being on their own. 
the vast majority lacking as well community communication and support. They're very much on their own. And women additionally weighted down by the responsibility of care for their family. The experience for better or worse is centered on the family. And it's a curious uh, statistic, but I'll share it. Suicide rates and divorce rates have come down sharply in Costa Rica in these months. In the last few weeks, things were shaken up by mass demonstrations against government measures and in accord with the International, International Monetary Fund. As in Chile, Bolivia, Colombia, and other places, neoliberalism has prevailed up to now, but it has not established its perfect crime, as Jorge Aleman, Argentinian psychologist says. If neoliberal, neoliberalism, as Lorton has stated, and, and Thomas has also pointed out, establishes its domination by a combination of sad and joyful affects. In the pandemic's limit situation, the joyful aspect has diminished and sad domination prevailed. This can cause fatalism and immobility, but it can also spark mobilizations if it is filtered by collective urges and projects. We might survive the pandemic, but so will capitalism recharge since it wasn't right at the beginning. And it can only be confronted in its exploitation, its extractivism, its colonialism, its economic market fundamentalism with imagination, organization, a lot of stubbornness and with projects for social change and psychologists need to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Um, fantastic stuff. Um, we finally come to our discussant, Nahuya. So I hand over to Nahuya, who's going to um, speak now. Thank you, Nahuya. Uh, you're yeah, muted. That's it. Oh, kia ora tato. And um, many thanks for inviting me to participate in today's session. I'm actually feeling quite overwhelmed and um, certainly um, challenged in a really good way. I looked at the early material that was distributed and given to me by David, whom I thank for his very kind invitation to participate in the session today. So ngā mihi ki akwe, David. And um, something that remains with me is an utterance by the outgoing orange abomination. In May, Trump said this, you wouldn't believe how bad these people are. This was May 2018. These are not people, these are animals. And, you know, considering the, um, last 10 days in the US, um, and then to receive all this amazing material from you really set me up and got me thinking about the world in which we live. Over the last hour, I've heard some extraordinary and um, truly visionary considerations. And I end up wondering too, what comes next? where do we go from here? We've had three theoretical presentations that have unpacked and dismembered and certainly exposed a lot of the weaknesses and the flaws and the horror of um, our current global situation from um, David Fryer, from Garth and from Thomas. But the last two were actually quite intriguing for me in that both um, Regina and Ignacio actually presented us with living, vivid, and um, certainly strong examples of what is happening within their own communities. And I think we need to refocus on that as we create 
and attempt to construct a solution to what is happening with the ghastliness of the current capitalist and I think anti-human environment. For me as an indigenous woman, um, one of the really acute and problematic situations within my own community and I've actually returned to my village and I'm becoming a little more involved with tribal politics is the absolute seduction of capital, is the absolutely um, undeniable intrusion of um, the idea of development and big money and corporate investment and the luring of overseas investors within the Māori world. This is always applauded as a really good thing. And so listening to you today and um, certainly considering the unpacking that you have all done has given me weaponry to take back to my own tribal councils. So for that, I thank you all. And um, I think I'll leave it there because I'd like to consider what some of the listeners and observers may want to ask you. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Nahuya. We'll hopefully have you to speak to some other questions as well. Really valuable insights from you, thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions, but please, um, audience, feel free to pose more. Um, I'll, I'll read Elisa's um, comments in full and she has a question towards the end and then there's a follow-up that's quite similar and I think both of them really relate to, I think as I, if I read them correctly, um, because they both talk about mentality in communities, I suppose they're questioning how we work um, with each other and with com in community on the really deep internalization of what you're describing in theory, I think. So Elisa says, I hear you. And I think you're talking about my island, Puerto Rico, um, um, a colony of the United States of America. Our leaders are mostly thieves. They promote neoliberal policies, corruption, fascism in disguise, inequalities, lack of opportunities of employment and education, economic dependence, pauperization, etc. And on the other hand, we find people's subjectivities that support them, even when it harms those people and their quality of life, just because they think they may be able to participate in small privileges that the corrupt might give them. What strategies can psychologists use to work from or with the community base to create awareness and solidarity with these problems in a colonized mentality country like Puerto Rico? And I suppose I could add as well that Miriam equally has a, um, a question that it seems to be a phenomenon that, they, that she finds, he or she or he finds here in Pakistan as well. Really like to hear what psychologists, perhaps other community members can do in community about this. Who wants to go first? <laughs> We heard most furthest away from David, but David, you're on mute, sorry. Here we go. Oh, no. You're still on mute, I don't know why. Okay. Yeah. Am I? All right. Um, right, I'm probably the last person that should answer this question because <laughs> I, I spent my, uh, my time basically saying that psychology is part of the problem and that they're the practices and ways of understanding and knowledges that psychologists bring to me are part of the problem of, of, of capitalism. They're a system which is involved in government, governmentalization, which is about control, controlling people by uh, apparatuses which reconstitute mentality or the subject in order for people to be compliant with the agendas of other systems or other people. But um, on the issue of, of mentality, to me, it seems really, really important to, to start to um, take mentality as being the 
if you like, a look at mentality. I think uh, both Ignacio and I both use the notion of lived experience. So I would say for some folks, lived experience or mentality is a sort of bedrock for which, um, which ca on which um, authentic knowledge can be built. Um, as sort of no doubt about it. From my perspective, mentality or subjectivity is a snapshot in a process of subjective reconstitution. And we need to be looking at the ways in which that reconstitution takes place. I mentioned in my talk at the beginning, working with Charles Marley, and um, Charles has spent a lot of time, and I've been trying to assist him as a, a colleague in that, in looking at um, the constitution of the uh, child or young person with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and looking at the confluence of factors which come together to produce that. So it, it opens up other areas in which one can think about um, engaging. Um, but this notion of mentality, I think for me, is um, something that we have to understand, including our own mentalities, and that when we are theorizing or when we are doing research, we have to understand it applies to us too, that we are being subjectively reconstituted as we change our minds, so to speak, as we develop different mentalities. Um, so how do we work in a community? To, to me, that issue is it's best if the war without bullets, as Kathy McCormack calls it, in that war without bullets, social workers, psychologists and other side professionals are on the wrong side. And the most appropriate we can think we can think about doing is to back off. This is talking as a, if you like, a, someone engaged in critique. As an activist, it's, it's a rather different position. For example, I have had no compunction whatsoever about drawing on positive, positivist quantitative research in an a instrumental fashion in order to try to persuade members of parliament, for example, that their economic policies are destructive, even though I don't believe that those positivist quantitative approaches actually provide a coherent and defensible um, legitimation for the knowledge claims they make. I'll stop there now, but just to say that we can be activists in one part and we can be theorists in another. And um, to me, the two things are sort of juxtaposed and sort of overlapping, but, but separate. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Regina, were you about to speak? Yeah, I can take a, a, um, an attempt at this question as well. So um, I think it's important that we look for dialogic um, kinds of solutions. And I think a little bit about what Garth um, spoke to and um, some of Quijano's work around this as well, that the problem with modernity and subjectivity is that knowledge construction has also been um, sort of subverted um, and instead what we have is uh, domination only. And so when I think about like what kind of dialogic processes might be beneficial or might you know work well, I actually think about some of um, Ermi Tapa Dutta's work and she's got a really lovely piece um, in Garrow Hills in India where she's bringing together people from different ethnic groups to do work, I think as a community psychologist, the work that I would say is most aligned with Ignacio Martin Barro's work in terms of um, surveying the broader community and seeing that there were actually a lot of, um, a lot in common, more in common than they thought they were going to have in common. And um, from that really got together and figured out how they could work together and then also reported results back to the community. So I think anytime we can hold up a social mirror, which seems really, really challenging in these times, given, you know, all of the fake news, especially here in the U.S., it's really challenging. But having people in a room together, speaking from their lived experiences with some, um, you know, guidelines to make sure that people are actually speaking from their experience seems like a really important uh, move to make. And then I think it's also important to, to remember that there are always going to be divergent answers. And um, in the same way David was just speaking, like it's, it's fine to use these sort of um, positivists or post-positivists, or maybe not fine, but in an instrumental way, that our solutions might even seem in contradiction with one another at different times. And we probably need that as well if we're really going to um, be able to 
to push past these dominant narratives and have the space for people to stop this looking away and really look closely and deeply at the violence that's happening in our communities. Thank you, Gina. Garth. Thanks, Rachel. It's useful if people put their hands up when they're about to speak, then I can see. <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks, Rachel. Uh, I mean, let, let me take a stab at it. And I want to pick up on, on what uh, Gina's just said. Um, in, in some ways, there are, there are probably three things that I'd want to say. The first is that I think that under these circumstances, one has always got to, uh, you know, factor in the kind of workings of soft power. And, and soft power in these circumstances always means that, uh, that everybody is prone to being co-opted in some way or another into processes where they are supportive of regimes of governance that in fact dominate them. So the idea that the, that, that, that the marginal are always progressive, I think is, a, is, is something that we need to interrogate ourselves because in fact, this is not always the case. Yeah, uh, people who find themselves on the periphery of, uh, of social formations are not necessarily by virtue of their marginality, uh, people who are, more, are necessarily more progressive. And so I think there is something about, about unpacking not only the way that um, regimes of governance work in relation to the exercising of soft power, but also the way that we sometimes make assumptions about the progressive potential or the transformative potential of people pr precisely because they sit on the margins or on the periphery of social formation. So uh, it, it's something about process that I think is going to be quite important there. But again, you know, coming back to people who are asking about what the role and the function of community psychologists may be under these circumstances, again, I want to kind of turn to those, those, those really important works by, whether it was Frey or uh, Ignacio Martin Barro or uh, the work on conscientization, the work on de-ideologization and the work on um, kind of denaturalizing that which we assume to be the natural order. Because I think it's in that process that, that Gina has been talking about around what is dialogical, what is there a way to, to engage people on their lived experience, and at the same time think about uh, what are the mechanisms to de-ideologize, what are the mechanisms to conscientize, what are the mechanisms to denaturalize? Because essentially what you're talking about is building a kind of consciousness that is politicized in some way or another. And I think that's critically one wants to build. A, a, a kind of solid civil society. Part of the difficulty, I think, in societies where, where one sees levels of corruption that we see in many parts of the world is that we assume that there's a strong civil society, but in fact, the civil society is actually quite weak. And I think that we really have to revisit the idea of what it means to build civil society under these circumstances. Thanks. Thank you, Garth. I think Ignacio was going to speak. Is that right, Ignacio? I was uh, thinking of a couple of things, and, this, uh, and I totally agree with David that uh, theoretical and uh, practice, social practice, uh, are not separate. You have to find a way of interrelating. But I was thinking of the topic of subjectivity, uh, sort of uh, on the idea of re rebellious subjectivity, that uh, there's a subjectivity of he or she that rebels. And uh, thinking of fascism and Thomas's uh, participation, I was thinking of what Reich wrote, that you had to acknowledge that Nazis, that Nazism had a revolutionary component. And I think this is a very, very important issue because we have Trump followers in Costa Rica, they're very, they're very vocal. Now they really show themselves and you would be amazed. And, but they place themselves as a revolutionary. So who is the revolutionary? Who is the conservative? Because placing, and I think this is very true for Trump, you know, uh, the followers, they don't see themselves as conservative or you know, passive. Uh, they're, they're revolutionaries. So the, in that axis of revolutionary conservative, how are things standing and how, how can you confront, how can you confront this? 
And the other thing I was thinking is that working with communities that was asked were well, my experience, our experience, if we're campesinos and campesinas and ecological groups and all that. And, it, and we've chosen to do it from the logic of our company and trying to provide, trying to help the process move along by very diverse uh, ways. But of course, the ideological subjective thing is very, very complex. You can have a, you can have a very, uh, uh, how would you say it, a very combative uh, campesino leader who is terribly, terrible in his, in his home, right? With his, with his uh, wife and his family. So you have to deal with all sorts of contradictions. But, uh, but I'm really intrigued by the, the idea of, of who, who, who's, what is the subjectivity or rebelliousness today? Thank you. Thanks, Ignacio. Thomas, did you want to respond? Yeah, I think if, if we take capitalism seriously, you also have to understand, I think, that the totalizing feature of capitalism makes it actually difficult to engage in projects of uh, de-ideologization or conscientization. So I think as academics, we have a tendency towards education and a case, I would make the case for the critical sciences, but at the same time, uh, we have to realize that the neoliberalization of academia undermines exactly mm -hmm. those projects. And what you have is sort of say a, a cost benefit instrumental logic that basically suggests that knowledge is only good to the degree that it produces instrumental value or you can make money or uh, you can actually something, do something very concrete with that knowledge. And so we have sort of say the retreat of the humanities and the social science. And I'm not even talking about the critical humanities, critical social science, but even traditional social science, traditional humanities are in the attack, let's say in the United States uh, and, and around the world uh, because they don't produce instrumental knowledge. And so the question then is, the question then is sort of say, you have one stream where you have the retreat of those uh, critical sciences uh, you have basically the, the difficulty that it becomes very el elitist. So to say, who can then afford uh, education has become very expensive here in public uh, universities. Uh, the, the luxury of uh, critical knowledge uh, to educate themselves and to educate themselves into a, a critical mindset that would resist some of those what I call fascist subjectivities or would rebel against the status quo and so forth. Uh, and the reality is then you have a certain uh, social group again that uh, is more sort of say open to those types of uh, um, uh, 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 critical uh, approaches. And I think there, in, in there you yourself have a bias. And so, and so then I'm teaching critical psychology. So I have a, a full year seminar and students in psychology come in at the fourth year and they never heard of any of those things in their life. And they're quite amazed actually that one can think about things in that way. And I think they come out with a certain type of critical uh, competency, but this takes one year, uh, or let's say a full academic year uh, to educate people. And so my point is indeed, so to say, who can afford those type of the, the luxury of and one year. And so, in, in recent context, I've looked at are there any other means for uh, developing critical consciousness? And I think the question is, can arts or arts-based research, can, can those things actually contribute much better to uh, uh, resisting and rebellion than a seminar that uh, is very cognitive focused? Uh, and when you have to deal, as I said before, with images and imaginations, and then you need a full year seminar to counter those or discourse analysis, whatever you want to use, whatever method you want to use to counter those um, fascist tendencies when, uh, when it is so fast to say to produce an image, a negative image about an immigrant, let's say, uh, or images of what they did in the States of the two immigrants 
to make the association with gangs and criminals. And, and so you need then, uh, you know, a year long seminar to counter that. And so the question is, can we move into arts based or uh, into the arts themselves, which are, seems to be to a certain degree more effective than purely cognitive uh, uh, approaches to, uh, to, uh, to challenging the status quo. Thank you, Thomas. We're just finished, but I just wondered if we could just get some last comments from Nahuya. I was about to, con well, to say that um, exploring the art space also um, gives the opportunity of further corruption and um, capture by the capitalist economies, by the investors, by the collectors, so that even our most famous artist here in Aotearoa, who was also a, a major activist, has become part of the gallery circuit, which turns it into a real contradiction. Um, another point I'd like to make as well before we go is that in educating and preparing young Indigenous people to be successful, if they are successful in the university and graduate context, they end up being seduced again by capital and by corporate. And the other option, of course, are the gangs and the evangelicals, who again end up being as extractive and destructive as the corporates. So we, um, we do need imagination. We do need rebelliousness. We do need to be stubborn. Stubborn and rebellious. I like that. Yes. <laughs> Good way to end. Great thank words. you so much, Nahuya. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, and thank you to Nahuya. Um, and thank you to the audience as well. We've got this quick coffee break now, and I'm sure some people are shooting off to other um, sessions at quarter two. I did just put a post in the chat because we just wanted to remind um, the, the conference, sorry, this is off topic from the wonderful panel we've just had, but we're very privileged to have access to a um, documentary movie that was made in Australia that's a fantastic movie in my blood it runs and you you as delegates you all have access to it until the 15th of november so we just wanted to put that information in there while we've got you thank you very much everybody